Miss Tempe's Watchers by Sarah Orne Jewett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recordings by Lindsay Philbrook, Salem, Massachusetts, 2014. The time of the year was April. The place was a small farming town in New Hampshire, remote from any railroad. One by one, the lights had been blown out in the scattered houses near Miss Tempe Dents. But as her neighbors took a last look out of doors, their eyes turned with instinctive curiosity toward the old house where a lamp burned steadily. They gave a little sigh. Poor Miss Tempe, said more than one bereft acquaintance, for the good woman lay dead in her north chamber, and the light was a watcher's light. The funeral was set for the next day at one o'clock. The watchers were two of the oldest friends, Mrs. Crow and Sarah Ann Binson. They were sitting in the kitchen, because it seemed less awesome than the unused best room, and they beguiled the long hours by steady conversation. One would think that neither topics nor opinions would hold out, at that rate, all through the long spring night, but there was a certain degree of excitement just then, and the two women had risen to an unusual level of expressiveness and confidence. Each had already told the other more than one fact that she had determined to keep secret. They were again and again tempted into statements that either would have found impossible by daylight. Mrs. Crow was knitting a blue yarn stocking for her husband. The foot was already so long that it seemed as if she must have forgotten to narrow it at the proper time. Mrs. Crow knew exactly what she was about. However, she was of a much cooler disposition than Sister Binson who made futile attempts at some sewing, only to drop her work into her lap whenever the talk was most engaging. Their faces were interesting, of the dry, shrewd, quick-witted New England type, with thin hair twisted neatly back out of the way. Mrs. Crow could look vague and benignant, and Miss Binson was, to quote her neighbors, a little too sharp-set, but the world knew that she had to be, with the load she must carry, of supporting an inefficient widowed sister and six unpromising and unwilling nieces and nephews. The eldest boy was at last placed with a good man to learn the mason's trade. Sarah Ann Benson, for all her sharp, anxious aspect, never defended herself when her sister whined and fretted. She was told every week of her life that the poor children never would have had to lift a finger if their father had lived and yet she had kept her steadfast way with the little farm, and patiently taught the young people many useful things, for which, as everybody said, they would live to thank her. However pleasurelessness her life appeared to outward view, it was brimful of pleasure to herself. Mrs. Crow, on the contrary, was well-to-do, her husband being a rich farmer and an easy-going man. She was a stingy woman, but for all that she looked kindly, and when she gave away anything or lifted a finger to help anybody, it was thought a great piece of beneficence and a compliment indeed, which the recipient accepted with twice as much gratitude as double the gift that came from a poorer and more generous acquaintance. Everybody liked to be on good terms with Mrs. Crow. Socially, she stood much higher than Sarah Ann Vincent. They were both old schoolmates and friends of Temperance Den, who had asked them one day, not long before she died, if they would come together and look after the house and manage everything when she was gone she may have had some hope that they might become closer friends in this period of intimate partnership and that the richer woman might better understand the burdens of the poor they had not kept the house the night before they were too weary with the care of their old friend whom they had not left until all was over there was a brook which ran down the hillside very near the house and the sound of it was much louder than usual. When there was silence in the kitchen, the busy stream had a strange insistence in its wild voice, as if it tried to make the watchers understand something that related to the past. I declare, I can't begin to sorrow for Tempe yet. I am so glad to have her at rest, whispered Mrs. Crow. It is strange to sit here without her, but I can't make it clear that she has gone. I feel as if she had got easy and dropped off to sleep, and I'm more scared about waking her up than knowing any other feeling. Yes, said Sarah Ann, it's just like that, ain't it? But I tell you, we are going to miss her worse than we expect. 
she helped me through with many a trial has temperance i ain't the only one who says same neither these words were spoken as if they were a third person listening somebody beside mrs crow the watchers could not rid their minds of the feeling that they were being watched themselves the spring wind whistled in the window crack now and then and buffeted the little house in a gusty way that had a sort of companionable effect yet on the whole it was a very still night and the watchers spoke in half a whisper she was the freest handed woman that i ever knew said mrs crow decidedly according to her means she gave away more than anybody i used to tell her it wasn't right i used really be afraid she went without too much for we have a duty to ourselves sister benson looked up in a half amused unconscious way and then recollected herself mrs crow met her with a serious face it ain't so easy for me to give as it is for some she said simply but with an effort that was made possible only by the occasion i should like to say while tempy is layin here yet in her own house that she has been a constant lesson to me folks are too kind and shame me with thanks for what i do i ain't such a generous woman as poor tempy was for all she had nothing to do with as one may say sarah binson was much moved at this confession she was even pained and touched by the unexpected humility you have a good many calls on you she began and left her kind a little compliment half finish yes yes but i've got means enough my disposition's more of a cross to me as i grow older and i made up my mind this morning that tempe's example should be my pattern henceforth she began to knit faster than ever tain't no use to get morbid that's what tempe used to say herself said sarah ann after a minute's silence ain't it strange to say used to say and her own voice choked a little she never did like to hear folks get going about themselves twas only because they're apt to do it so other folks will say twasn't so and praise em up humbly replied mrs crow and that ain't my object there wasn't a child but what tempy set herself to work to see what she couldn't do to please it one time my brother's folks had been stopping in here the summer from massachusetts the children was all little and they broke up a sight of toys and left em when they were going away tempy come right after they rode by to see if she couldn't help me set the house to rights and she caught me just as i was going to fling some of the clutter into the stove i was kind of tired out starting em off in season oh give me them says she real pleading and she roped em up and took em home with her when she went and she mended em up and stuck em together and made some young one or other happy with every blessed one you thought i'd done her the biggest favor no thanks to me i should have burnt em tempy says i some of em came to our house i know said miss benson she'd take a lot of trouble to please a child stead of shovin out of the way like the rest of us when we're drove i can tell you the biggest thing she ever done and i don't know there's anybody left to tell it but me i don't want to forget sarah benson went on looking up at the clock to see how the night was going it was that pretty-looking trevor girl who taught the corner school and married so well afterwards out in new york state you remember her i dare say certain said miss crow with an air of interest she was a splendid scholar folks said and give the school a great start but she'd overdone herself getting her education and working to pay for it and she all broke down one spring and tempy made her come and stop with her a while you remember that well she had an uncle her mother's brother out in chicago who was well off and friendly and used to write to lizzie trevor and i dare say make her some presents but he was a lively driving man and didn't take the time to stop and think about his folks he hadn't seen her since she was a little girl poor lizzie was so pale and weakly that she just got through the term of school she looked as if she was just going straight off in a decline tempy she cosseted her up a while and then next thing folks knew she was tellin round how miss trevor had gone to see her uncle and meant to visit niagara falls in the way and stop overnight now i happen to know in ways i don't dwell on to explain that the poor girl was in debt for her schooling when she come here and her last quarter's pay had just squared it off at last and left her without a cent ahead hardly but it had fretted her thinking of it so she paid it all 
they might have done her that she owed it to and i taxed tempy about that girl's going off on such a journey till she owned up rather than have lizzie blamed that she'd given her sixty dollars same as if she was rolling in riches and sent her off to have a good rest and vacation sixty dollars exclaimed mrs crow tempy only had ninety dollars a year that came into her rest of her living she got by helping about with what she raised off this little piece of ground sand on one side and clay on the other and how often i've heard her tell years ago that she'd rather see niagara than any other sight in the world the women looked at each other in silence the magnitude of the generous sacrifice was almost too great for their comprehension she was just poor enough to do that declared mrs crow at last in an abandonment of feeling say what you may i feel humbled to the dust and her companion ventured to say nothing she never had given away sixty dollars at once but it was simply because she never had it to give it came to her very lips to say in explanation tempy was so situated but she checked herself in time for she would not betray her own loyal guarding of a dependent household folks say a great deal of generosity and this one's being public-spirited and that one free-handed about giving said mrs crow who was a little nervous in the silence i suppose we can't tell the sorrow it would be to some folks not to give same as it would be to me not to save i seem kind of made for that as if it was what i'd got to do i should feel sights better about it if i could make it evident what i'm saving for if i had a child now sarah ann and her voice was a little husky if i had a child i should think i was heaping of it up because he was the one trained by the lord to scatter it again for good but here's mr crow and me we can't do anything with money and both of us like to keep things same as they've always been now priscilla dance was talking away like a mill clapper week before last she'd think i would go right off and get one of them new-fashioned gilt and white papers for the best room and some new furniture and a marble top table and i look at her all struck up why i says priscilla that nice old velvet paper ain't hurt a mite i shouldn't feel it was my best room without it dan'l says it's the first thing he can remember rubbin his little baby fingers on to it and how splendid he thought them red roses was i maintain continued mrs crow stoutly that folks wastes sights o good money doin just such foolish things tearin out the insides o meetin houses and fixin the pews different wasn't good as it was with mendin and then times come and they want to put it all back the same way as it was before this touched upon an exciting subject to active members of that parish miss binson and mrs crow belonged to opposite parties and had at one time come as near hard feelings as they could and yet escape them each hastened to speak of other things to show her untouched friendliness i do agree with you said sister binson that few of us know what use to make of money beyond everyday necessities you've seen more of the world than i have and know what's expected when it comes to taste and judgment about such things i ought to defer to others and with this modest avowal the critical moment passed when there might have been an improper discussion in the silence that followed the fact of their presence in a house of death grew more clear than before there was something disturbing in the noise of a mouse gnawing at the dry boards of a closet wall near by both the watchers looked up anxiously at the clock it was almost the middle of the night and the whole world seemed to have left them alone with their solemn duty only the brook was awake perhaps we might give a look upstairs now whispered mrs crow as if she hoped to hear some reason against their going just then to the chamber of death but sister binson rose with a serious and yet satisfied countenance and lifted the small lamp from the table she was much more used to watching than mrs crow and much less affected by it they opened the door into a small entry with a steep stairway they climbed the creaking stairs and entered the cold upper room on tiptoe mrs crow's heart began to beat very fast as the lamp was put on a high bureau and made long 
fixed shadows about the walls. She went hesitatingly toward the solemn shape under its white drapery and felt a sense of remonstrance as Sarah Ann gently, but in a business-like way, turned back the thin sheet. Seems to me she looks pleasanter and pleasanter, whispered Sarah Ann Vincent impulsively as they gazed at the white face with its wonderful smile. Tomorrow twill all have faded out. I do believe they kind of wake up a day or two after they die, and it's then they go. She replaced the light covering, and they both turned quickly away. There was a chill in this upper room. Tis a great thing for anybody to have got through, ain't it? said Mrs. Crow softly, as she began to go down the stairs on tiptoe. The warm air from the kitchen beneath met them with a sense of welcome and shelter. I don't know why it is, but I feel as near again to Tempe down here as I do up there, replied Sister Benson. I feel as if the air was full of her, kind of. I can sense things now and then that she seems to say. Now I never was one to take up with no nonsense of spirits and such, but I declare I felt as if she told me just now to put some more wood into the stove. Mrs. Crow preserved a gloomy silence. She had suspected before this that her companion was of a weaker and more credulous disposition than herself. "'Tis a great thing to have got through,' she repeated, ignoring definitely all that had last been said. "'I suppose you know as well as I that Tempe was one that always feared death. Well, it's all put behind her now. She knows what it is.' Mrs. Crow gave a little sigh, and Sister Benson's quick sympathies were stirred towards this other old friend, who also dreaded the great change. I never like to forget almost those last words Tempe spoke plain to me, she said gently, like the comforter she truly was. She looked at me once or twice that last afternoon after I'd come to set by her and let Miss Owen go home, and I says, can I do anything to ease you, Tempe? And the tears come into my eyes, so I couldn't see what kind of nod she give me. No, Sarah Ann, you can't, dear says she and then she got her breath again and says she looking at me real meanin i'm only a gettin sleepier and sleeper that's all there is says she and smiled up at me kind of wishful and shut her eyes i knew well enough all she meant she'd been looking out for a chance to tell me and i don't know she's ever said much afterward mrs crow was not knitting she had been listening too eagerly yes will be a comfort to think of that sometimes, she said in acknowledgment. I know that old Dr. Prince said once, in evening meetin', that he'd watched by many a dying bed, as we well knew, and enough o' oh, his sick folks had been scared o' dying their whole lives through. But when they come to the last, he'd never seen one but was willin', and most were glad to go. "'Tis as natural as being born or living on,' he said. I don't know what had moved him to speak that night. You know he wasn't in the habit of it, and it was the monthly concert of prayer for foreign missions anyways, said Sarah Ann, but was a great stay to the mind to listen to his words of experience. There never was a better man, responded Mrs. Crow, in a really cheerful tone. She had recovered from her feeling of nervous dread. The kitchen was so comfortable with lamplight and firelight and just then the old clock began to tell the hour of twelve with leisurely whirring strokes. Sister Benson laid aside her work and rose quickly and went to the cupboard. We'd better take a little to eat, she explained. The night will go faster after this. I want to know if you went and made some o' your nice cupcake while you was a home today, she asked in a pleased tone. And Mrs. Crow acknowledged, such a gratifying piece of thoughtfulness for this humble friend who denied herself all luxuries. Sarah Ann brewed a generous cup of tea, and the watchers drew their chairs up to the table presently, and quelled their hunger with good country appetites. Sister Benson put a spoon into a small, old-fashioned glass of preserved quince and passed it to her friend. She was most familiar with the house and played the part of hostess. Spread some of this on your bread and butter, she said to Mrs. Crow. Tempe wanted me to use some three or four times, but I never felt to. I know she'd like to have us comfortable now, and would urge us to make a good supper, poor dear. What excellent preserves she did make, mourned Mrs. Crow. None of us has got her light hand at doing things tasty. She made the most of everything, too, 
now she only had that one keens tree down in the far corner of the piece but she'd go out in the spring and tend to it and look at it so pleasant and kind of expect the old thorny thing into bloomin she was just the same with folks said sarah ann and she never get more'n a little apron full o kinses but she'd have every mite o goodness out o those and set the glasses up on to her best room closet shelf so pleased twa'n't but a week ago to-morrow mornin i fetched her a little taste o jelly in a teaspoon and she says thank ye and took it and the minute she tasted it she looked up at me worried as could be oh i don't want to eat that says she i always keep that in case o sickness you're goin to have the good old one tumbler yourself says i i'd just like to know who's sick now if you ain't and she couldn't help laughin i spoke up so smart oh dear me how i shall miss talkin things over with her she always sensed things and got just the point you meant she didn't begin to age until two or three years ago did she asked mrs crow i never saw anybody keep her looks as tempy did she looked young long after i began to feel like an old woman the doctor used to say it was her young heart and i don't know but what he was right how she did do so for other folks there was one spell she wasn't at home a day to a fortnight she got most of her livin so and that made her own potatoes and things last her through none o the young folks could get married without her and all the old ones was disappointed if she wasn't around when they was down with sickness and had to go and cleanin or tailorin for boys or rug hookin there wasn't nothin but what she could do as handy as most i do love to work ain't you heard her say that twenty times a week sarah ann benson nodded and began to clear away the empty plates we may want a taste o something more towards mornin she said there's plenty in the closet here and in case some comes from a distance to the funeral we'll have a little table spread after we get back to the house yes i was busy all mornin i've cooked up a sight o things to bring over said mrs crow i felt it was the last thing i could do for her they drew their chairs near the stove again and took up their work sister benson's rocking chair creaked as she rocked the brook sounded louder than ever it was more lonely when nobody spoke and presently mrs crow returned to her thoughts of growing old yes tempy aged all of a sudden I remember I asked her if she felt as well as common one day, and she laughed at me good. There, when Mr. Crow began to look old, I couldn't help feeling as if something ailed him, and like as not was something he was going to get right over, and I dosed him for it stiddy, half of one summer. How many things we shall be wanting to ask Tempy, exclaimed Sarah Ann Benson, after a long pause. I can't make up my mind to doin' without her. I wish folks could come back just once and tell us how it is where they've gone. Seems then we could do without em better. The brook hurried on. The wind blew about the house now and then. The house itself was a silent place, and the supper, the warm fire, and an absence of any new topics for conversation made the watchers drowsy. Sister Benson closed her eyes first, to rest them for a minute and mrs crow glanced at her compassionately with a new sympathy for the hard-working little woman she made up her mind to let sarah ann have a good rest while she kept watch alone but in a few minutes her own knitting was dropped and she too fell asleep overhead the pale shape of tempe dent the outworn body of that generous loving-hearted simple soul slept on also in its white raiment perhaps tempy herself stood near and saw her own life and its surroundings with new understanding perhaps she herself was the only watcher later by some hours sarah ann benson woke up with a start there was a pale light of dawn outside the small windows inside the kitchen the lamp burned dim mrs crow awoke too i think tempy'd be the first to say it was just as well we both had some rest she said not without a guilty feeling her companion went to the outer door and opened it wide the fresh air was none too cold and the brook's voice was not nearly so loud as it had been in the midnight darkness she could see the shapes of the hills and the great shadows that lay across the lower country the east was fast growing bright twill be a beautiful day for the funeral she said and turned again 
with a sigh to follow Mrs. Crow up the stairs. End of Miss Tempe's Watchers by Sarah Orne Jewett